Okay, so uh, last three months, uh, what we uh, were speaking about in the uh, YSP program with Science Voices was uh, creating a Latin American network for native bees. And uh, what is a Latin American network for native bees specifically? Uh, we figured out through all our, um, you know, uh, textbooks reading and uh, certain papers that uh, there there is uh, uh, this type of bee, the native bees in Latin America are not being monitored um, as they're supposed to. So specifically Bee Works is an initiative to link uh, the existing knowledge uh, basis over native bees in Latin America in communities. Uh, this means that uh, merely the communities that, um, for example, uh, uh, Dr. Lev is being working with uh, in Sao Paulo can be connected with uh, communities that are in Central America as well uh, that we've been linking up to um, in the la last uh, weeks. Uh, so basically, what is a native bee and specifically what is uh, a stingless bee? A stingless bee, as you can tell by the name, is uh, a bee that uh, can't sting. Uh, they live in tropical regions, uh, produce honey with medical properties, and play crucial roles in pollination. Now, one of the reasons that we, uh, why we need to monitor uh, these bees is that they are um, specifically in uh, danger of, uh, of extension and uh, uh, being more um, specific. They're they're very important for communities in the case that in communities that use agroforestry. So I might show you a little video right here that I, I took before. Um, this is how the hives look. And uh, I am going to talk a little bit more about uh, this uh, thing that's placed on the hive. But as you can tell, they're very different from what a uh, usual hive would be in, in, at, at normal bees, and, as, as in the walks. Um, OK, so let's go on to presentation mode okay. as well. Um, as I said before, a stingless bees uh, in textbooks are usually mentioned through uh, just uh, theoretical information over their behavior, and that's why uh, we need to monitor them. Um, it hasn't been really being studied because of the very shortage of, uh, um, not shortage, but I would say the, the uh, short amount of scientists that are willing to study this uh, kind of uh, phenomenon that's been happening with bees. So, uh, about what the work in Sao Paulo. In Sao Paulo, as we learned in the program with uh, Dr. Lev, there have been workshops being done in uh, Wapiruvu and certain um, communities uh, that are five, six hours away from uh, the cities. Uh, um, specifically, what they do is teach the people on how to take care of uh, bees. Um, they, they explore how the communities relate to the bees and, and really how um, these bees can help them um, uh, produce uh, medicine, how they help agroforestry in, in general. And as you can tell here in the small presentation, here is uh, Dr. Lev in the, in the right, right screen. Okay. This is the team um, in general that has been working with, that we have been working with uh, this, uh, this month. Uh, everyone has been very helpful in aspects. And um, a little fa facts about the bees that we can mention is that they are locating in Valle de Rivera, Sao Paulo. Um, the eco ecological significance, uh, they host 21% of the remaining uh, Atlantic uh, rainforest. Uh, the inhabited indigenous and uh, indigenous African and European communities, and as well the economic context uh, in Sao Paulo is that uh, it is one of the poorest and least economical developed uh, regions in Sao Paulo state. Okay. So um, after all this, we said, okay, what can we do in, in BeeWorks? We can put on all this knowledge and uh, also engage the students that are in these communities to also uh, monitor the bees. So uh, the purpose of uh, the BeeWorks program is connecting between communities uh, working with bees Connections between the communities that are working with bees. Also, uh, we offer to the communities being part of the first Latin American network of uh, monitoring native bees, uh, create guides for building sensors to monitor bees, and a, a potential future work on a website to store citizen science data. Now, as you can tell here, uh, we ha we utilized um, uh, different tools. This was one of the more educational tools for, uh, for example, three D printing. Um, as you can tell, uh, this is Autodesk Tinkercad, and the sensor that I've been working with um, in the last uh, months is uh, to count bees and correlate 
them to um, the temperature and uh, the humidity that's outside from the hive. So uh, what we expect is to uh, test this more in the next few weeks. Uh, as you can tell, uh, it is easy to replicate by students and it is supposed to be cheap as well. Uh, during this uh, month, we also had the, um, uh, I also had to, to um, look out for what, what has been done already to monitor bees. And what I found out is that many uh, sensors, they're uh, intrusive in the hives. So as you can tell here uh, in the small design, it's a design that's put on in, in the uh, hive. And this is very intrusive in their behavior. Um, this is not something that we would like to do with uh, potential partners. As you can see in the right, this is one of the farms that we uh, linked up, linked to in the last weeks is Calva Farms. Calva Farms is a, a small farm that actually dedicates to meliponic culture here in where I live, which is uh, Antigua, Guatemala. And uh, they were willing to be part of the project in, in the next few months. So at the end of the day, what we thought would be a good design is something that could be placed outside of the hive and not in the the hole where the bees come out from, uh, but but be a, a non-intrusive uh, sensor, as I said it before. Uh, you can tell here that this is these are some of the pictures um, of the hives, and this is the sensor that we work with. And, as you can tell here, this is a PIR sensor to check the movements of the bees uh, from the hole they come from. This is a uh, DHT11 sensor, and this is a um, ultrasonic sensor so that we can check the movements and whether they come out of the hive or not. Of course, uh, there are some, some things that we need to work uh, on uh, as well. And uh, the experiment that we would like to do in the next weeks as well is to um, place a camera with a Raspberry Pi to see whether the sensor works and whether we should change it uh, or have it through more iterations uh, in the next uh, in the next uh, weeks. Okay, so the future work that is proposed with this uh, program is uh, creating the citizen citizen science website. Um, the engagement of the manuals, uh, and as well creating this uh, huge Latin America um, uh, network as we began with Calva Farms, which is, is in Guatemala. As you can tell here is the small architecture and a small um, uh, uh, screenshot of how the website would look like in, in the homepage of the website. But uh, yeah, that's, uh, I feel that's everything right now. Okay. Yes. Great job, Sebastian. Um, we have time, a little time for some questions. It looks like Sanjoy's hand is up. Sebastian, that's a very inspiring project. Uh, thank you so much for all the work you're doing to help the bees. I think they're a very important part of our ecosystem and are under threat. So this is really, really inspiring work. I was, I didn't quite catch what data you're actually gathering of the bees and why those specific data. Okay. Okay. So um, one of the problems that's been happening in Sao Paulo with, um, as I'm being told by by Dr. Lev, is uh, what they wanted to do is count the amount of bees that uh, enter the hive and go out from the hive and correlate that to the temperature and the humidity that's outside from the hive. Yeah. Hit CR, I saw your hand next. Yes. I don't know if this is a dumb question. But when he when he you when you, when Sebastian talked about uh stingless bee, it reminded me to a myth. I don't know if it's a myth. Like when I was little, they always t told me that the bees when they sting once, they they only sting once in their life because like they sting stakes is like stays in your like skin, and then it rips their guts out basically. So how is that possible to monitor stingless bee if they're they they die days after stinging for the first time in their life. Or okay, are you talking so, about some other type of bees? Uh, uh, this types of bees uh, is is a different time type of bee that they oh, don't so have. Oh, so they stings. don't have they don't uh, have a sting. Wow. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I actually have a video here if you can if you would like to see it. Um, yeah, here is it is. So uh, we, when we open the hive, you can tell that these are much smaller bees. Oh. Uh, 
they're not as big as the ones. Uh, the also the the hives they're they're not the same. They're different. So these yeah. types of bees they they don't uh they don't sting, and so uh, the... that's what's curious about them. Oh, yes. that's that, that's curious. I've never I I never knew that there was a type of bees that don't have a sting. So that's why when when you say stingless bees, I immediately thought about that because like. I'm like I'm not allergic to anything, but every time I saw a bee when I was growing up, or even now, I try like not to bother them because like I'm so scared they're gonna die. You know what I mean? Like they're important to the ecosystem. So when I heard that, I I really didn't know. Like I was so confused of stingless bees because I never, you know, not picamos. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Thank you for clarifying uh... that. Like every time, like every day, you knew so like you learn something new. So I'm just like so wow. Thank you. <laughs> Yeah, I think it's so cool. I, even there was this sign in the Calva Farms uh, here in Guatemala. It says, we're friendly. Uh, we don't sting. Native bees. Yes. Okay. Uh, Jacob, yes, I see your hand up. Yes. <laughs> yeah, sure. The, the great presentation. This is fascinating. Great work. Um, so I just have a question about the bees. I do, you know, beekeeping here in the U.S. And the, the yeah, the hives are pretty different. So... In mm -hmm. you know, if we want to have a, a catch bees, you have to catch a hot a swarm, and then they kind of move into the hive. Um, you know, with the honeybees that we have. So I'm wondering, is that the case where the bees swarm or something, and each of those is a new colony, or did the bees in in the wild actually kind of move in and out of those hives, and you can kind of measure, you know, the native population by counting the hive? Is, is you know, we, we, just a little clarification. I'm curious how that works. Okay, so uh, first off, uh, s s there was this um, thing that happened uh, a few weeks ago uh, that we were talking with Dr. Leth. Um, th they're very difficult to, to um, handle. Um, uh, so it, 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 I, I'm not quite sure I, if, if you could clarify that with, with us, uh, Dr. Lev. Um, yeah. Because I remember you telling me um, about moving the hives and the the bees not being able to find it um the next day uh, yeah so for duplicating the hives it's the inverse of stinging bees um i, f I forget uh stinging bees is it the uh, queen that goes first and then the colony follows or is it the other way around yeah the queen goes first Ah, okay. So for stinging bees, the hive goes first. So the workers will scout out a location. And after they've kind of established a starter nest, then the queen will follow. But because there's such a strong connection with the hive mates uh, between the new nest and the old nest, they don't tend to go very far when they are splitting. So that's why their um, geographic area is a little more restrained. Uh, they often get outcompeted, especially by the Africanized honeybees. Um, and so, uh, and then there are multiple ways of splitting the hives. You can, uh, they have an egg disc uh, with uh, honey pots that surround it or are on top of it. And you can do it by splitting, uh, taking uh, the uh, hive structure there and just splitting the layers. Uh, and then the uh, top layer will generate a new egg disk and the egg disk will generate a new top disk. Or you could just take an egg disk out and implant it in a new one. So often there'll be an old egg disk and a new egg disk. Um, so it, it's quite different from uh, stinging bees. And it's, and it's much safer. I had a swarm of thousands out in front of my door this morning because apparently the queen uh, wanted to get some mates and I was just walking back and forth through them all day with no problem because uh, they're just tiny. Very cool. Thank you. Yeah, this was awesome. I, Great job. Scott. I have a textbook. If if you want to read it, I can share it with you about uh, native bees. Very cool. Yeah, I, I love that comment, McCollin. <laughs> it's only really during Blue Psycon that we get to see the true breadth of what goes on at BMSIS. Um, I agree entirely. It's been an incredible day so far, and we still have some more talks to go. Um, there are two more.